when you know the spiritual quality of the Taoists, and you know that there, there are different meanings and intents, you can answer some questions about uh, our humanity, you can answer some questions about ourselves, you can find some relief. It's about a search, a humble approach to finding answers through two art forms. One, retablos. The other, ex votos. The retablos tell of the saints and their role in the lives of the faithful. The ex votos, offerings of thanks for a miracle received. There is perhaps no bigger collection of retablos and ex votos than at this art gallery at New Mexico State University, a region where the tradition has been firmly embraced. The retablos is an incredible uh, uh, art form uh, in the sense that uh, it represents or expresses people's not only uh, faith and belief, but above all their artistic and their, their search for uh, art. With their haunting images and levels of artistry that range from crude to enlightened, the retablos and ex votos seem to speak to those who see them. Oh, this is humanness coming into our lives from the spiritual, and uh, it brings us closer to, to the light or God or whatever interpretation we have of it. What stories lie hidden behind these religious paintings? What did they mean for the people who owned and prayed to them? And what role do they play in our world today? These are the questions that surround El Favor de los Santos. San Antonio de Padua was a Franciscan priest and an advocate for the poor and downtrodden. According to legend, the host of a house where San Antonio was staying saw a radiant light pouring from under the door of the saint's room. Peering through the keyhole, he saw that the source of the light was Christ as a child, seated in the saint's arms. San Antonio de Padua is the patron saint of travelers, sailors, and the poor. He is the finder of lost things and the saint of trivial appeals. Los santos son intermediarios entre Dios Padre, el Espíritu Santo, Jesús, y el hombre. Dios Padre es sumamente abstracto. El Espíritu Santo todavía más. Ni siquiera se le representa como un ser humano, sino como una paloma. Y Cristo, bueno, Cristo es un personaje me, medio histórico, eh, medio simbólico, pero es difícil establecer una relación directa con Cristo para el común de los mortales. Cristo es, de, es el Hijo de Dios. En cambio, un santo, pues un santo es ante todo un hombre. Fue un ser humano con características que lo, eh, le, lo, le hicieron merecer estar en la gloria, pero en fin, tuvo sus debilidades, sus flaquezas, conoció al menos las debilidades de la humanidad, y entonces aparece como un mediador más cercano. Eh, creemos en ellos porque hemos logrado muchos milagros de ellos, y de allí nos nace, a cambio de sus milagros, hacer su retablo y venírselo a traer porque nos hizo la maravilla de hacer, de, es que ellos son los abogados de nosotros, ellos, le, ellos que están cerquitas del Señor, ellos abogan por nosotros, le piden que les conceda hacerles, hacernos el milagro, y si el Señor se los concede, ellos no lo hacen. San Ramón Nonato lived during the 13th century. His name means not born, as his mother died while giving birth. As a member of the Mercedarian order, he gave himself in exchange for Christian hostages held by Muslims in Algiers. In order to keep him from converting other prisoners, the governor had his lips pierced and locked them shut. San Ramón Nonato is the patron saint of secret keeping, midwives, childbirth, and pregnant women and of the falsely accused. El caso de San Ramón Nonato también, un personaje que, que nace gracias a casi un milagro porque lo los sacan del vientre de su, de su madre que acababa de morir y, y después que va, a, que va a ser prisionero 
Entonces, todas las, las advocaciones de los santos o los santos tienen una cierta especialización de acuerdo a, a lo que ellos sufrieron y sobre todo lo que ellos superaron, para que nosotros no nos quedemos nada más en el sufrimiento. The cult of the saints was a, a, the cult that uh, developed as a result of um, uh, the church trying to get people to see in the lives of exemplary people a number of values that they wanted to promote. Thus, for example, the martyrs, Saint Sebastian, we think of as a martyr of the church and an, as an important saint because he died defending the Catholic religion okay, and would, did not, would not deny his Christianity. There have been other saints that were known for their acts of charity, uh, acts of virginity, acts of purity, acts of kindness, Um, and all of these are human qualities that are believed to be important to lead a, a model and moral life. And so the saints are supposed to serve as role models, examples on how you should live uh, your life. When the Spanish conquistadores arrived in the New World, they brought with them the Catholic religion and its array of icons, all portrayed through art. The church was in the midst of the Counter-Reformation, a reaction against the growth of Protestantism. The Counter-Reformation was an effort to revive enthusiasm within the church and increase numbers through evangelicism. And it's this reformed Catholicism, either in the experimental phase that's before the Protestants, um, that is to say from 1490 to 1550, or in the more orthodox phase that came after Protestantism, which is 1560 and on. Uh, it's this reformed Catholicism, uh, which was the faith that was established in the New World, first by Franciscan and the Dominican missionaries, and later by uh, other groups, the Augustinians, the Jesuits, and so forth. Well, so this means that if you go and look at the categories of counter-reformation art, reformed Catholic art of the 1500s and 1600s, it's exactly the same category as you find in Santos. You find images of um, Christ that refer to the Eucharist. You find images of the Holy Family. You find images of a vigorous Saint Joseph as patron of the church and as a model father. Among all the suitors for the hand of La Virgen Maria, legend tells that San Jose was chosen because his was the only staff that bloomed. He is shown always with his flowering staff dressed in green and yellow, the colors of fertility, hope, and regeneration, and marriage, faith, and fruitfulness. He is the patron saint of carpenters and is considered a model for the ideal husband and father. The Aztec culture encountered by the conquistadores already had an established and ancient religion, and the idea of being guided in their worship by a set of symbols was not unfamiliar. The religious influence of the conquistadores led to a process known as syncretism, where an established religion is replaced with a new one and yet still maintains some aspects of the old. Everybody had a home altar with different images of different saints for specific functions. And uh, when the Catholic Church, Church came into the New World in the midst of the Counter-Reformation, that was the time when evangelization became a, a stronghold of the Catholic Church, and art was used as a propaganda for the Catholic Church, they absorbed that already existing faith of the people. I think that pre-Columbian religions were very visual, that you had cult images, some of them rather horrible, of these uh, fantastic gods that they had. And it was just trading one set of gods for another from an from a artistic point of view. However, that changed a lot of things. It changed the way these images were presented. And uh, a European formula uh, replaced the pre-Columbian or pre-Hispanic indigenous formulas, not simply in terms of, uh, of, of the thing portrayed, but in the way it was portrayed. Sometimes the, the religious orders have been very accommodating, saying that they will simply try to bring these customs, these behaviors, these religious activities into the orbit of the Catholic Church, and as I said, baptize the pagan saints.
or pack, baptize the pagan shrines by building a church around it and thus conjoining the Catholic meanings with the uh, much more ancient indigenous meanings. But then at other times they've tried to destroy it. You know, they've uh, pursued and, and killed and persecuted individuals that were worshiping at these shrines, filled them in with sand, destroyed them, uh, not allowed, I mean, kept soldiers there to make sure that people didn't worship there. of symbols to portray meanings and messages is an ancient practice yet still applies to our world today. When we're looking at symbolism, we're looking at something that's very common in the modern world. Every one of us, when we go into a deli, we go into a 7-Eleven or even a Whataburger, um, look at the refrigerator there with different soft drinks in it and immediately pick the one we like. Now, some people are Coke drinkers and some people are Pepsi drinkers. And you'd never confuse the two if you're one or the other. You'd never confuse a Dr. Pepper with a ginger ale. And what makes this possible millions of times a day is they each have a can, and on the can there's a symbol, and that symbol says inside this can is a drink that tastes a little bit like cough syrup, and a lot of people like in the South. <laughs> or in this can is a, uh, 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 a tamarind-based uh, uh, brown drink that... Um, has been popular in the world since the late 1800s, or in this can is a, is a, is a drink based on ginger, or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, there's signs pointing to what's in the can. Well, from earliest art, the very first art we know of in the Paleolithic, that we assume is religious, you have this same kind of function. So that in Christian art, a uh, cross tells you what religion you're in, um, a crescent moon with a young adolescent girl dressed in blue and white on it talks about the Virgin Mary and theological doctrines that apply to her. And after it's used enough, it ceases to be an emblem or just a sign and becomes a symbol that is universally recognized. So whenever you see uh, a saint with uh, specific attributes, you know that that saint is, for example, San Francisco de Paula or um, Santa Rita de Gracia or something like that, just because the attributes that go with that specific saint. And uh, those attributes also is part of the, of the history of that of that specific saint, like, uh, I don't know, like uh, Santa Lucia she, she suffered martyrdom, and I think that they removed her eyes or something like that. <laughs> it was pretty ugly, but you see always, always Santa Lucia with a um, plate with two eyes there. So you know that's Santa Lucia. San Isidro de la Cabeza was a man of great faith, but also an extremely hard worker. He worked so hard that he could not go to church so God sent him an angel to help him with his labors in order that he could resume his devotions. San Isidro is the patron saint of farmers and is responsible for the harvest and good weather. As the worship of saints and other Catholic icons grew in the New World, so did the different methods of worship. In Mexico, one of the most popular forms of representing Christ, la Virgen, and the saints was the retablo, a word derived from two Latin words, retro and tabula, which literally means behind the altar, where retablos were traditionally placed. With the Industrial Revolution, retablos began to be painted on tin, making them more durable and more available to the working class. Oh, 
Spanish missionaries in the New World were intent on using their symbols to replace those of the Indians. They quickly set up workshops for the production of religious artwork, especially retablos. At the heart of this production was the Mexican city of Zacatecas. Zacatecas lies in the heart of colonial central Mexico, the capital of the state of Zacatecas. It is an area steeped in Mexican history, long renowned for its mineral riches, especially silver. Since it was first settled by the Spanish, Zacatecas has also been known as an area of religious zeal, nicknamed La Evangelizadora del Norte, or the Evangelist of the North. As early as the 16th century, missions were established in and around the city, funded by the wealth being produced by the mines. While the first purpose of the missions was conversion, they also served as workshops where religious images brought from Europe were reproduced. The rich history of mining and the dangerous lives lived by the miners also contributed to the deep devotion to certain symbols by the people of this area. Edificando varios altares en cada nivel. El Santo Niño de Atocha viene siendo una de las tres imágenes más visitadas que hay en la República Mexicana por la fama de ser muy milagrosos. Altars dedicated to icons such as the Santo Niño de Atocha were built deep within the mines with the hope that they would watch over the miners in their treacherous work. Miracles that have occurred in mines are portrayed in ex votos. En el mineral del Santo Niño, el día 14 de septiembre de 1944, después de haber entrado a la mina, in the Santo Niño mine on September 14th of the year 1944, after having entered the mine, 14 miners were left trapped after a rock slide sealed the entrance, and having lost all hope of being rescued, they entrusted themselves with great fervor to the mercy of the miraculous image of the Lord of Villaseca, having been granted their lives after 11 days in the mine, with many thanks we dedicate this to him. Con el mayor agradecimiento Le dedicamos el presente. The 19th century in Mexico was a violent time. Wars were fought, power was constantly changing hands, and countless lives were lost. Amidst this uncertainty, a need for spiritual guidance added to the Mexican people's increased use of retablos and ex votos. I think the period of the 19th century in Mexico was an incredible turmoil in their political system. There was over 30 changes of government in 19th century Mexico and towards the end of the century some of the reform governments tried to uh, pretty much boot the church out of the country and uh, really restrict the Catholic Church in its mission and at that time of turmoil and the government trying to restrict the church, people turned to this household art form, the retablo, for worship in their home. That's the way they, they got their strength, you know, to pray to these saints and, uh, or, or Christ or Virgin Mary, and it was you know, their, their only hope. They didn't have anything else. It was their only hope and uh, their only strength. It was the only stable thing in their lives and in a very uh, unstable, unstable situation in Mexico at that time. There was an explosion in number beginning in the mid-1800s and this is reflecting socioeconomic development where patronage at a lower middle class or working class level was able to afford such an object. And part of that is driven by the um, availability of the tinned steel support where what would have earlier been a very expensive thing to do became a very cheap thing to do. The retablos itself, you can tell that they were placed in a house. You can uh, see on the surface, of course the retablos they are on the show, they have been restored and preserved, but we have a number of retablos that have a lot of uh, 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 a layer of uh, uh, dust, a layer of smoke, and some of them even have, uh, the, the candle probably was placed so close to the image that has burned 
a, a, a part of the retablo creating this personal uh, 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 idea of how the piece was used, not as an art, not to decorate their homes, but to be part of their life as, as a, a, a member of the family and part of their belief. The role of the santero, or maker of saints, was also very important within the church and community. Entonces mi abuelo me decía, uh, para este miércoles de ceniza tenemos que tener, vamos a decir, un San José listo para la parroquia. Entonces como santero nosotros hacíamos el San José. Y nosotros estábamos a un nivel cerca de, 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 del padre, ¿verdad? Cerca del cura. Llegamos nosotros y decíamos, pues, ¿qué, qué necesitan? Y que necesitamos esto o que arreglen este nicho y muchas veces estamos arreglando bancos de la iglesia entonces la forma en que el santero realmente eh, funciona o evoluciona alrededor de una parroquia es algo que realmente es parte de la religión propia de nosotros el artista normalmente no cobraba por sus obras es decir no costaban cinco centavos diez centavos un peso a lo mejor costaban un poquito pero no lo que valían porque los demás de la comunidad por ejemplo, los, los que eran campesinos, le daban maíz o le llevaban al artista para que él siguiera ejerciendo su oficio. Es decir, era parte. Así como dentro de una comunidad a, a, hay una persona que, que ejercía como partera, por ejemplo, las mujeres que ayudaban a los partos, no había hospitales, también había quienes eran artistas. Por eso es tan difícil saber el, quién pintó los retablos. Another popular form of devotion during this time was the ex voto, derived from the Latin word for vow. The ex votos were commissioned and painted as a form of thanks, recognition for a miracle granted. Hallándose Doña María partida en una muy grande aflicción, se encomendó... Being in a great affliction, Doña María partida gave herself to Nuestra Señora de Lourdes de San Pedro, who granted her relief from her affliction and giving thanks for the miracle that she made them, I present this retablo on the 6th of February, 1882. Son verdaderas historias eh, pintadas, ¿verdad? O sea, que ponen todas las circunstancias, un barco, un la tren, fecha. la fecha, las personas con su mejor traje, algunos vestidos de charros, las señoras con sus vestidos eh, muy, muy elegantes, es decir, tratando de, de, de no presentarse delante de los santos eh, con un traje ordinario, sino con su, su traje de domingo. With their humble thanks and simple drawings, the ex votos present a window into a life that was hard and full of challenges, where often the only shoulder to lean on was a firm belief in miracles. Uh, día 4 de enero, on the 4th of January in 76, Don Mauricio Velázquez, being gravely ill due to ulcers in his throat, entrusted himself to Nuestra Señora de Lourdes and became well. In December of the year 1531, an Aztec Indian named Juan Diego was on his way to a Catholic service when a vision of the Virgin Mary appeared to him. She told him that she desired a church to be built in her honor where she appeared on the hill of Tepeyac. The Virgin Mary appeared to Juan Diego three more times and on her final appearance gave him a cloak filled with roses to give to the unbelieving bishop. When Juan Diego presented the cloak to the bishop, the flowers disintegrated and the image of the Virgin was left on the cloak. This image became the Virgen de Guadalupe. She is the patroness of the Americas and her name is invoked to remedy ills and for protection against evil and war. As the centuries progressed, cults began to develop around certain icons particular to Latin America. La Virgen de Guadalupe is one of the most recognized and venerated symbols in Mexico and Latin America. People feel a close connection to her as the protector of their country and a powerful icon that belongs solely to them. El ser mexicano es algo esencial. Ser guadalupano es algo esencial. Esencial quiere decir que cosa linda, cosa muy grande, muy grande y muy poderosa. Por eso nosotros hemos 
guadalupanos, mexicanos, consentidos de la Virgen. Y ese orgullo tenemos, que estamos de aquí, tenemos con nosotros a nuestra madre de Guadalupe, que es la madre del mismo Jesús. Porque la Virgen María, bueno, fue virgen y madre, lo cual la pone bastante fuera de la norma. Pero al mismo tiempo fue una mujer sencilla. Una mujer eh, con un marido, con un hijo, que aceptó la muerte de su hijo, que conoció el dolor. Eh, y, y es eh, sentida, es percibida por la mayoría de los católicos como también un ser más cercano. Images of La Virgen de Guadalupe can be found throughout Mexico, but nowhere more clearly than at La Basílica de Guadalupe in Mexico City. It is here that La Virgen appeared to Juan Diego, and where the original image presented to him is kept. Millions of pilgrims flock here each year, seeking the guidance of La Virgen de Guadalupe. Tienen esperanzas, deseos de que sus sus necesidades se cumplan, se logren y, y en, viniendo a estos lugares este, la creencia, la religión eh, con tanta fe hace que se cumplan sus deseos. The idea of syncretism or the combination of two religions can also be found in the appearance of la Virgen de Guadalupe. It was a, shr a shrine at which uh, people used to pray and offer devotions to Tonatzin, uh, that was an Aztec goddess, uh, particularly of, of uh, an earth goddess of fertility. And so the fact that you build a cathedral right where you used to worship a, a native female goddess, uh, you know, brings together the idea of the old Tonatzin with uh, the idea of the Virgin of Guadalupe. And there's no coincidence that who does, who does the, the Virgin appear to, uh, you know, Juan Diego, an Indian. Um, uh, she appears as a swarthy virgin, you know, that looked almost like Tonatzin. So the idea is that, you know, it, it combines both. So when a, when a pilgrim goes to the, the shrine of a Virgin of Guadalupe, there are probably ancient meanings that are still remembered by people that are activated and mobilized by a trip there, but also then constrained, defined, circumscribed by the Catholic Church. Y a la madre de Guadalupe ya no me acuerdo cuánto le pido porque yo, yo en diciembre le rezamos muchos rosarios y le cantamos muy lindo. Si yo le platicara todas las oraciones que sabemos de la Virgen de Guadalupe, con cuánta dulzura hablaste, oh madre mía, Juan Diego, fueron tus palabras la garantía de que eres madre del verdadero Dios y madre también de los mexicanos. Así se lo dijiste al felicísimo Juan Diego que tuvo la dicha de escuchar tu conversación. Gracias te doy con toda mi alma porque siendo madre de Dios unipotente quisiste ser por adopción en el Calvario, madre de todos los cristianos, madre especial de los nacidos acá. Somos tus hijos aquí ingratos y pecadores, pero, pero te reconocemos. Bendecimos tu santo nombre y te amamos con todo el corazón. During the Moorish occupation of Spain, only children were allowed to visit the Christian prisoners. One day in the town of Atocha, a child appeared dressed as a pilgrim, carrying a staff, a basket, and a gourd of water. The prisoners were fed, but miraculously, the basket and the gourd remained full. The Santo Niño de Atocha, a representation of Christ as a child, is the patron saint of prisoners and protector of travelers and people in danger. The Santo Niño de Atocha has also become a popular symbol in the New World with many shrines and sanctuaries dedicated to his name. The largest shrine in Mexico dedicated to the Santo Niño can be found in Plateros in the state of Zacatecas. The walls of the sanctuary are lined with ex-votos offering thanks to the Santo Niño. Cada uno de estos retablos es el testimonio de un milagro realizado, ¿no? de un milagro contestado. Entonces eso es, eso es muy bonito, ¿no? Venir a ver todo esto. Desde cualquier punto de vista, ¿no? Si uno los ve como una persona creyente, tienen un significado, ¿no? Si tú los ves como, si eres un poco sociólogo, historiador o lo que sea, para todos tienen una lectura, ¿no? Eso es lo importante de todos estos testimonios, ¿no?
perhaps because he represents protection for those in danger or because as a child he is less imposing. For whatever reason, it is obvious that people feel a strong connection to Christ as a child. El caso del niño de Atocha es, es, es muy, muy interesante porque él que nunca desamparó a los prisioneros que habían sido encerrados por los moros, los musulmanes, tampoco iba a desamparar a su, a su gente que vivía acá en estas, en estas dificultades. De modo que esa es la que me parece a mí que hizo que se arraigara tanto esta tradición. Una, una manera de estarse acordando y al mismo tiempo estar como implorando, pidiendo que esa fuerza llegara a, a uno mismo. Tal vez por la dificultad de no creer en algo. Quizá esa sería la, la pregunta fundamental. Eh, en un siglo como el siglo XX, cuando una serie de comunidades occidentales u occidentalizadas empiezan a asumir descreencias y falta de fe, eso finalmente deja muy expuesta a las comunidades en su correlación entre ellos mismos. As newer printing methods were developed at the beginning of the 20th century, the use of tin for religious paintings began to die out. Now these same images could be printed in mass quantities at a fraction of the cost. And the time-consuming art of hand-painted retablos and ex-votos began to fade. Santa Librata was the daughter of a Scandinavian prince. She was of such faith that when her father tried to force her into an arranged marriage, she prayed that she could grow a beard in order to escape this fate. When she was actually able to grow one, her father ordered that she be crucified. Santa Librata is one of the 14 holy helpers. She protects against headaches and is the patroness of laundresses. In the same spirit that motivates artistic creations, these pilgrims are on a quest. In the city of Las Cruces in southern New Mexico, the Tortugas Indian tribe has been making yearly pilgrimages to the top of Tortugas Mountain for nearly a century, a sign that although new technologies may change the form in which icons are portrayed, their traditions today remain strong, deeply rooted in the faith of the people. The Pueblo people, in this valley, all up and down the Rio Grande Valley, as far north as Taos, and further south than Tortugas, have always had as a tradition to travel to a mountain, to travel to the mountains, to pray. Uh, here in this valley, we have made Tortugas Mountain our holy mountain. Every year from December 10th through the 12th, members of the tribe living in and around Las Cruces and from across the United States gather for the fiesta of Our Lady of Guadalupe. When the Pueblos were Christianized by the Franciscanos, um, we converted to Jesus Christ. We were baptized in the Catholic Church. We believe that the Virgen de Guadalupe came here to the Americas for us, for all people in the Americas, but especially for the native people. She's ours, she's special. She is our connection to the Catholic Church, to Jesus Christ, to God. On the evening of December 10th, the image of the Virgen is carried from La Capilla, the little chapel, to La Casa del Pueblo, the community house. She is carried by four couples accompanied by Los Danzantes, the dancers. A silent night of prayer follows, broken only by the firing of shotguns to ward off evil spirits. Early the next morning, the pilgrimage to the top of the mountain begins. La Virgen de Guadalupe is carried four miles up the mountain, with many pilgrims following behind. Some carry their own images of La Virgen. Some have shed their shoes, all quietly contemplating their devotion to the Guadalupana. There are as many reasons for making the pilgrimage as there are people. 
Some people come in Thanksgiving. So many people make a promesa, a promise, to come once. I have known of people who made a promesa to come for life and keep it. I know of people who have come for 40 or 50 years until the day they die. Around midday, once everyone has arrived at the summit, candles are lit in prayer, religious songs are sung, and a mass is held, with all in attendance receiving the sacrament. When I was young, I climbed for the fun of it. Uh, as I got older, I prayed. Uh, I prayed for a happy life, a good life, a healthy life. I prayed for my parents. Uh, when I came back from Vietnam, I prayed in thanks for my life. I would uh, walk every year with my brothers and sisters, would make a promise of my, for my dad when he was ill, we'd always walk, that he'd be better. 300 miles further up the Rio Grande, a different sort of pilgrimage takes place each year on Easter weekend. I ask for blessings for the whole entire family that uh, we can all continue to, to be the united family that we are. And that uh, I ask for blessings for the, my mother, that uh, during her sickness that she can be as healthy as, and comfortable as she possibly can, because uh, she's, she's very sick right now. These pilgrims are making their way to El Santuario de Chimayo in this northern New Mexico village. They come in search of help, prosperity, healing, guidance. Everyone has their own reason for making the journey, some from as far away as Albuquerque, nearly 85 miles to the south. One thing about this, you got a lot of time to think. You, you don't have got my music and stuff, but I, you know, you think about a lot of things and so many miles down the road, you're like, you know, nothing else matters. You know, it's just, you're just fortunate to be alive and able to be healthy enough to walk. It is the legend of the Santuario that draws the thousands of pilgrims who make their way here each year. It tells of Bernardo Abeita, whose family originally owned the land on which the Santuario is built, who one night, near the end of the 19th century, saw a light coming from the ground. He started to dig and found that the source of the light was a crucifix. He recognized this to be a miracle, and since there was no parish in Chimayo at the time, Bernardo and other members of the community took the miraculous crucifix up the road to the town of Santa Cruz. The next day, the crucifix was gone and was rediscovered once again in Chimayo. It was returned to Santa Cruz and again was found the next day in Chimayo. This happened three times before it was decided that the cross must remain in Chimayo and the santuario was built on the site. Today, Chimayo is the most visited religious sanctuary in North America. Perhaps coincidentally, perhaps not, this site was a place of worship for native peoples long before the arrival of the Spaniards. Pilgrims take with them sand from within the santuario, which is believed to have healing powers. Crutches and testimonies to miracles received line the walls of the sanctuary, and crucifixes made from sticks are placed along a fence outside. Y como conseguían muchas de las cosas que pedían, pues hay este espíritu de fe en Dios en las, y los santos. Del Padre, del Hijo y del Espíritu Santo. Much of what the Santuario de Chimayo is today is owed to this man, Father Roca, who came to Chimayo from Spain in the 1950s. He was responsible for establishing a parish in this area, creating and uniting the several missions throughout the small villages of this area of northern New Mexico. Father Roca is practically synonymous with the Santuario de Chimayo, and he welcomes the pilgrims this year as he has for nearly 50 years. Some of the pilgrims have been making the journey nearly as long as Father Roca has been in Chimayo. My father-in-law about 20-some years ago uh, uh, started 
uh, a walk from Albuquerque, and he got all the way to the turn off there by the bridge. And he never got to finish it. And uh, so my mother-in-law had mentioned it. So I said, well, I'll finish it for him. And I've just been kind of doing it ever since uh, now, probably almost 20 years. Uh, my eagle feather, my brother gave me this. He's having trouble with his health now. So I'll carry this for you, bro, and I'll take it up there and put it in the sand. And yeah, I'll help you out and anything positive. I feel like a like a spirit comes through you. I feel um, like God watched me, he guided me through it, and uh, we do suffer a lot as we walk far, um, but it's, it's worth it, it's worth the journey. San Jeronimo lived during the fourth and fifth centuries. He was born in the Balkans and was a great scholar and the doctor of the church, responsible for revising the gospels and psalms. His greatest accomplishment was translating the Vulgate, or Old Testament, from the old languages into Latin. San Jeronimo was an ascetic and lived the life of a hermit in the deserts of the Middle East. He is shown contemplating the symbols of his penitential life, the hat and robe of a cardinal and a lion. San Jeronimo is the patron saint of librarians. In the town of Guanajuato, Mexico, Leonardo Diego Rivera, a relative of the famous Mexican painter Diego Rivera, continues the tradition of painting ex votos and retablos on tin. El señor Pablo Rocha Chia da gracias al Santísimo uh, Señor de Villaseca por cu cu curarlo de una caída fuerte que, que sufrió trabajando en la presa del Encino, cerquitas al el mineral de Santana. Guanajuato es uno de los uh, acontecimientos de mineros. Rivera has been painting ex votos and retablos for over 40 years. It is an art he refers to as the art of the poor. Quizá tengan más necesidad de Dios por su pobreza, que se invocan así, porque la persona que ya pues se siente económicamente ya mm, controlado y todas las cosas, como que no se acuerdan mucho de Dios. The artwork in Rivera's ex votos remains simple as they have been painted for centuries. Las pinturas son rústicas, no, no es así una forma mm, muy dedicada así a, a muy complementada, no, porque se perdiera entonces la esencia de lo que es eh, de lo que es el origen del retablo, del voto. Debe ser de sea rústico, espontáneo, de, 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 del sentimiento de, de la persona que, que le pasó ese detalle. With his dedication to his work, Rivera carries on a tradition that might otherwise be lost. San Benito de Palermo was the son of Christianized African slaves in Sicily and lived during the 16th century. He was given his freedom at 18, and shortly thereafter he joined a Franciscan monastery. His extreme piety earned him the nickname the Holy Black. San Benito is seen always with the lily, the crucifix, the scourge, and the flaming heart to show his purity, piety, and religious fervor. He was the patron saint of black slaves in Latin America, and today is the patron saint of black North Americans. Well, it's a naive, almost primitive style. It's very personal. Um, it's interesting the way the time and space and the images uh, are secondary to the purpose of the image, it, especially in the ex photos how the artist would have a particular event that they were recording and, and um, the way they would place the images on the tin plate or on the paper. Uh, there wasn't a lot of attention paid to balance and symmetry and uh, the things that you s sort of think of as artistic, but it's very personal, so I appreciate that more.
A huge red tableau exhibit like this one shows an expanding interest in this art form, artistically, but also in a religious and cultural sense. I hope those people who just take a um, casual glimpse really ask the, the deep questions. Why are these art forms there? How did they get there? And what have they meant for our, our communities over the years? You ask those questions, you're, you're going to find a lot of history, a lot of story. We decided to do a very broad contextual uh, 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 exhibition going from the Aztecs all the way to 20th century and how these 19th century uh, pieces fit in within the pre-Columbian, the academic Baroque pieces from Mexico and the 20th century altar that was also, is also in the exhibition. Hundreds of hours of work went into preparing the show, including the painstaking process of restoring the retablos, many of which have seen extensive use. I think it's, this, this whole project is really important. First of all, because it's gonna um, make a precedent of, the, is it gonna be the first time that someone is gonna make it this, um, kind of conservation. There is no literature about conservation in paintings on tin, oil paintings on tin. There's no literature about that. And um, no huge investigation or research about how to conserve these type of tins. And that was one of the challenges for all of us because there is nothing reading. There is no research about it. And we had to make all kinds of tests until we end up with the best conservation treatment. So that's, that's really important because I think that we are the first ones that we are doing something like this. Along with a growing interest in the artistic and cultural aspects of retablos has come a commercial interest, a fact that has some people worried. Ya casi está perdida. Ya casi está perdida sobre todo porque se, han, se les ha puesto precio. Y yo distingo entre precio y valor. Es decir, no todo lo que vale cuesta. <risa> eh, y, y, y modernamente creemos que lo que cuesta vale. No, no siempre lo que cuesta vale. Un amanecer en el, en el, aquí en el Nuevo México no cuesta nada. Y vale mucho. Entonces, creo que actualmente la, comerciali la comercialización ha, ha, ha causado que que ya se, se pierda bastante una tradición que básicamente era gratuita. Entonces ahora ya se valora el artista, se, se compra a un precio que según la Galería de Santa Fe o la Galería de Nueva York. Y, y hay gente que viene aquí y dice que se ha comprado una casa fabulosa en Santa Fe, necesito uno de estos. Y se van con la cara caída a veces porque le digo, no, no lo puedo hacer, ¿verdad? Y no se puede hacer porque sencillamente va, sabes que está yendo a un lugar en donde lo van a explotar. Entonces, no hay explotación en este tipo de arte. Eh, este no es un tipo de arte, arte. Este es un tipo, vamos a decir, eh, de sentido religioso. Y hay gente que tiene la tendencia de que si se está vendiendo, tienen que vender mal o, o tienen que hacer otro. Es precisamente porque yo hago la cuestión religiosa en un porcentaje bajo. Y si a más gente quiere, quiere el arte que yo hago, hago contemporáneo, hago abstracto, Hago uh, Southwestern, que le llaman, y hago cosas que la gente realmente no puede ni entender que hice, ¿verdad? Y luego, pero no voy a, a poner una cosa comercial, mis santos. Ya no hay esta particularización, esta individualización del lugar, de la fecha, del acontecimiento preciso, del nombre del beneficiado. Es algo absolutamente abstracto. Entonces, me parece que si se vuelve tan abstracto, y anónimo el retablo ya pierde su, la función que yo señalaba, ¿no? De, de integración de la experiencia personal dentro de, de, de la gran esfera religiosa que va desde el nacimiento de Cristo hasta el año del jubileo eh, y esta, esta dimensión, este espesor terrenal y sobrenatural. Estos pedacitos, estos cuadritos, rectángulos de mármol ya no dicen nada a nadie.
Porque en el momento en que tú lo quitas de aquí, descontextualizas todo el mensaje, ¿no? Esto es para venir a leerlo y ver qué es lo que es. Es un producto de la fe, ¿no? Y cuando ya está en una exhibición ya es otra cosa, ¿no? Pues yo creo que es mejor verlos aquí, ¿no? Es mejor verlos aquí. Dicen más y este, incluso cada uno tiene una historia. Y, y yo, por ejemplo, me, me gusta leer e imaginarme todo el contexto en el cual fue escrito ¿no? y pintado. Whether or not meaning is being lost through commercialization, there is no doubt that faith in the saints remains strong. For example, Our Lady of Light, uh, she became now in modern times the patron saint of the electricians, which they didn't have in the 19th century, so early 19th century. So in the 20th century, they accommodate and they modify Our Lady of Light, so electricity, so she is going to be the patron saint of the electricians. So there is this accommodation and change and modification. Aside from their religious intent, retablos are being appreciated in other ways. One of the great gifts to aesthetic appreciation uh, that modern abstract art has given us is that expressions of popular art so-called tribal or folk arts, have from the very beginning of this century been appreciated, not just for their anthropological value, but for their artistic values. And modern art posits that academic training is not essential to artistic achievement. And I think it's something that everyone accepts. So that an untrained artist in Zacatecas, North Central Mexico, or more likely in a small city outside of Zacatecas, could, with only the humblest of artistic training, only the rudest of techniques, express him or herself and express the, the values that the image wanted to express magnificently, but within the rubric of what we call folk art. You know, I think there's a definite need for spiritual uh, relevance in our society. I think you find some relief in knowing that there are uh, santos for, for grief, santos for um, support, santos of love, and things like that. I think we need those reminders that we, we have sources of support for humanity and for ourselves. Esto ayuda a la identidad, es decir, estas son las raíces de, de, del pueblo. Entonces, creo que para toda gente que quiere realmente ser culta, vivir en, en, en la cultura, esto es, es muy importante. It is certain that as we move into the rapidly changing world of the 21st century, ordinary life with its ups and downs, trials and rewards, and little miracles will continue. For those who believe, and maybe for those who don't, there will always be times when we will call on el favor de los santos. Los santos trabajan, los santos trabajan, no hay duda. Desde luego tienes que tener fe, si lo vas a poner y no vas a trabajar. Es, es, no es una cosa mecánica como tal vez eh, querer prender un carro o algo así. Es una cosa completamente eh, eh, fuera del control de uno, es una cosa de fe. Pero, ¿Por qué? Es porque los santos trabajan.